Welcome to Healthy vs. Toxic, the podcast where licensed mental health professionals explore what makes a relationship healthy or unhealthy or even abusive, all from a scientifically informed perspective. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can take a look at the characteristics of a wife who's narcissistic. So in this video, I'll be focusing on a husband and wife relationship ostensibly a relatively stable one. And this, of course, could also apply to a long-term partnership, whether or not the couple was married. The idea here is the expectations are that the couple will stay together, support each other, and work to meet common goals. Some of the things that we would expect from a long-term relationship. So I'll answer this question by looking at the 10 characteristics of a wife with narcissistic traits. There, of course, are a lot of signs, I'm focusing here on the narcissistic behaviors that would be directly observable by the husband. So first I'll take a quick look at narcissism and then get right into the 10 characteristics here. So what is narcissism? Well, narcissism is a set of personality traits characterized by being self-centered, having a sense of entitlement, having a need for admiration, and having low agreeableness, being disagreeable. Now, when we move past this, we get into two types of narcissism grandiose and vulnerable. With grandiose, we see characteristics like being self-confident, having superficial charm, being arrogant, being resistant to criticism, being callous, unemotional, and having externalized anger. With vulnerable narcissism, we see characteristics like being distrusting, feeling insecure, being resentful, having a lot of shame, being hypersensitive to criticism, being defensive, cold, distant, unforgiving, and having internalized anger. Much of the time when somebody's narcissistic, They tend to fluctuate between these two types of narcissism. So this list will have characteristics related to both types. Now, as I read the items in this list, when I use the term wife here, I'm talking about a wife with narcissistic characteristics. And when I use the term husband, I'm talking about a husband who does not. Because if both people have narcissistic characteristics, that would really be a different list. That would manifest differently. So again, the wife's narcissistic here and the husband is not. So moving right into the list with characteristic number one. This is a continuous sense that the wife is disappointed. She's disgusted by the husband's appearance, his earnings, like at his job, his contribution or lack of contribution to household chores, interactions with the children, his motivation, his educational level. So really, in many ways, if not in every way, the wife is putting the husband down. And this really fits into this narrative that the wife puts forth that she's a victim of a bad marriage, a bad husband. At the same time, the wife would be highly responsive if another woman is interested in the husband, right? Which seems inconsistent with this continuous sense of being disappointed. Number two, the wife tends to take sides against the husband by default. So she assumes the worst of the husband. She has a lot of distrust for him. So an example here would be something like if there's some sort of home improvement that the couple wants to do, like remodeling a room, putting down a floor, repainting, replacing light fixtures. Now, some people are good at this and some people aren't, but no matter what the skill level is, the wife is going to be skeptical about the quality of work that the husband can deliver. Maybe even to the point where she hires somebody after the job is done to do it right, right? To come back and fix everything that she thinks the husband did wrong. Now, the point of this isn't really to fix anything. It's to embarrass the husband and not give him any credit for being proficient at anything. Giving him credit would run against this narrative that he's a bad husband. Now moving on to number three. Number three involves the fantasies of success, power, wealth, and other factors that we see with narcissism. So this is kind of an unusual characteristic of narcissism. Somebody who's narcissistic has these fantasies somewhat frequently, And they tend to be fairly stable fantasies, like the same fantasy over a long period of time. Now here with the wife who's narcissistic, we would see several that involve another partner, like a replacement for the husband. And these aren't really delivered in a subtle way. Now, narcissistic fantasies extend into the future most of the time, but they can also be in the present and in the past. This is one of those kind of unusual angles that we see here with these fantasies. So the fantasy could actually be going back in time and marrying somebody more worthy, a better provider, a better lover, 
Fantasies are often about undoing something that somebody regrets. And we often see that reflected in the phrases that are used. Phrases like, I never should have settled. I should have listened to my family members, who I guess would have said not to marry the husband. I should have trusted my instincts. Now, of course, as I mentioned, the fantasy could also be in the future, and most of the time it would be. And with the future-oriented fantasies, we see that the wife is clear that if the fantasy could ever come true, she's gone. The marriage is over. She's not even pretending that there's a good relationship between the couple. Consistent with all the types of fantasies, the wife compares the husband to other men. She points out how other men are better. Now, what's interesting about these fantasies as well is that if the husband is doing something that supports one of the wife's fantasies, she gets along with the husband. So she gets along with him when he's working toward one of her fantasies. So if he takes a new job that's more demanding on him, but it pays better, the wife could be supportive, right? That kind of feeds into her fantasy, more money, or it could be just having him have a house more. That could be the fantasy as well, giving her more opportunities to explore alternative relationships. Number four is that the husband is paying for the sins of others. So what do I mean by this? Well, we see that in a lot of cases when people are narcissistic, they experience some sort of maltreatment when they were younger. So maltreatment from a prior husband, prior boyfriend, parent, other relative, whoever it was in the case of the wife who has narcissistic traits. Every problem the wife has becomes the husband's fault. He is assigned all the blame. The husband, in a sense, becomes a composite of all those wrongdoers. And with his actions, whether they are right or wrong, they represent all the bad things that happen to the wife. So he represents the wrongdoers, and his actions represent all the bad occurrences. It's like when people take their anger out on a punching bag. The punching bag never did anything to anybody, but it's still going to pay. It's still going to pay for all that anger. So an example here could be somebody in the wife's past denied her material goods. They weren't generous with her, or maybe they didn't even meet her basic needs. So the way she kind of expresses this in terms of relationship with the husband could be running up credit card debt, essentially weaponizing her spending. When she's caught, when the credit card bill comes in and somebody has to pay it, she suggests that this makes her even with the husband. This is actually a very common way for a wife with narcissistic traits to explain away maladaptive behavior. The narrative that the wife paints has always been one where they're both hurting each other, but unequally, right? She has the worst end of the deal. So if she gets caught with this bad behavior, she says, okay, for right now, this just makes us even. And this is typically the most blame that the wife will ever accept, regardless at what point in the marriage that we're looking at. Number five is that there's no true connection in the marriage. So the wife is emotionally distant and callous. And this is really not surprising given the characteristics of narcissism. We can see a lot in the style of communication between two people. I've worked a lot with couples where one or sometimes both of the people are narcissistic. But again, here I'm just talking about a situation where one person is narcissistic. And it's really fairly easy over time to kind of pick up how some relationships are really cold and distant and how destructive that is to the relationship. We see that when the wife is confronted, when she's asked to talk about emotional topics, she dodges them. She avoids depth or more likely is incapable of connecting deeply and she gets frustrated. So she might say something like, I don't know what you want. We're talking. I don't know what you want me to say. So there's just really no room to move. There's no room to move more deeply. The wife gets stuck in the narcissism, right? It's a block to moving into an emotionally fulfilling and close relationship. Moving number six, we see here, the wife prevents the husband from making friends, venting frustrations, or seeking support. So specifically on that venting frustrations piece, the prevention tactic here is that the wife starts complaining, right? So she counter complains every time the husband complains. So that just shuts down the venting of frustrations. Now, in terms of the friend component, if the husband does make a friend, this friend is labeled a loser by the wife. The friend has to go. She's not going to tolerate that relationship. She might say something like, 
What about that other friend you have, or you had at one time? Knowing the husband and that other person she's referring to are not in contact anymore for whatever reason. So she's throwing out an alternative that doesn't really work in an effort to say, look, go spend time with that friend instead of this friend. Really, this is just an isolation tactic, and if the husband tries to criticize one of the wife's friends, then he's being controlling. So we see a really clear double standard here. Now, speaking of double standards, this brings me to item number seven. We see here a double standard when it comes to self-improvement. So if the husband suggests to the wife that she could change some behavior, that a change might be good for the relationship, he gets this strong negative reaction and blame shifting making it about the husband instead of about the wife. So the wife really takes no ownership of her behavior, and there's no conceding that there may be a benefit in changing her behavior. So again, we don't really see the wife giving any ground. She does not or cannot recognize the negative impact that this has on the husband, because to the wife with narcissistic traits, the husband is not a real person. Number eight, making the husband feel guilty for wanting to be intimate. I see this all the time in couples where one of the members is narcissistic. So when the husband inquires about being intimate, the wife might say, not again. I can't believe you want this again, right? Really trying to lay a guilt trip on the husband for having a drive. She makes it seem like a chore or a burden. And this is beyond the simple sex drive differential that we see in a lot of relationships. This is really something that's designed to isolate the husband and contribute to a strong feeling of loneliness, like we see in several of these different behaviors. And of course, in some instances, this increases the vulnerability to temptation for the husband and can lead to a whole other series of problems. Number nine is threatening to leave, threatening to pursue like financial support in family court to destroy the husband financially to take the house, to take the cars, to take the kids, to take the dog, whatever it is, to take everything, right? So it's kind of a scary threat because, of course, the prospect of divorce and dividing material assets is scary, right? It makes sense that people would be afraid of that. Now, she might also threaten to tell all his friends and family that he's a loser, tell the kids he's a loser. So a lot of dissemination about his ostensible loser status, right? So this is actually a fairly effective method of manipulation because this threat of hurting him financially and hurting his reputation is, again, very strong. It's a powerful threat, and it's used to eliminate scrutiny. It's really a distraction technique. Usually we see this threat issued when the husband has some sort of criticism of the wife. And, of course, that criticism is shut down right away after this manipulation tactic is deployed. And this moves us to number 10 on the list thoughtlessness. So there are many examples of thoughtlessness in these type of relationships. We see like not getting gifts on special days like Christmas or Valentine's Day or the husband's birthday, or buying gifts that show little thought. If the husband expresses any type of negative sentiment about these gifts, like if he dislikes the gifts, he gets a strong reaction. So really, he's discouraged from doing that. We also see here that in terms of being thoughtless, the wife inserts herself into every purchase that the husband makes. Say, for instance, the husband wants to buy a new smartphone. The wife might say, what are you getting for me if you're getting that for yourself? I'm not going to carry around this old phone if you're getting a new one. Also, the wife can leave the husband out of important plans, like vacation plans or dinner plans or something like that. Oh, I didn't know you wanted to go there. You never expressed an interest in that before. So really just kind of self-centered. Now, the paradox about this lack of thoughtfulness is that the husband can see the thoughtfulness that he would want. It's the thoughtfulness that the wife directs at herself. So the husband sees it all the time. It's on display clearly in this relationship, but no part of that is for him. So in a sense, the wife looks capable. She knows how to be thoughtful, but she's choosing not to invest any effort or caring in the marital relationship. Thanks for listening. This has been a production of Ars Longa Media. The producers for this show are Christopher Brightigan and Madison Linden. The executive producer is Dr. Patrick Beeman. For more content, please visit our website at arslonga.media. 
to leave feedback or suggestions, send an email to info at arslanga.media. To find more content from Dr. Grande, including a link to his YouTube channel and his other Ars Longa podcasts, visit our website at arslanga.media. This podcast is intended for informational purposes only and should not be construed as medical or mental health advice. Ars Longa, Vita Brevis.